Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and this is going to be the first of three MMA videos for this weekend. And I know I've been promising you three for the last couple of weeks, but I've kind of run out of time. Uh, but this week we are going to do them. We're going to be doing this video, which is going to be going over the best DFS plays, going through the metrics and things like that. The second video, which is going to probably happen uh, tomorrow, is or tomorrow morning, is going to be the betting breakdown, which is going to be very contrarian. And then later on tomorrow, we're hopefully going to be able to do a lineup construction video where we focus in on just some techniques to uh, use Saber Sim and use the Sims and use other kind of, you know, a little bit of funny business to try to win you know, the big 200K first prize in the, uh, the big GPP this week. And as you know, from watching this, these videos, there is quite a bit of difference between um, who the best plays are and who to actually play in that particular type of contest. I'm going to try to, you know, do a little bit of lineup construction in this video um, because I do feel as though that second video is really technical. You know, it, it's really just banging around with settings and 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 things like that. Um, and it doesn't really get into a lot of the the fundamentals. So I'm, I want to blend this one a little bit more if, if possible. Well, we'll just see how that goes. First of all, um, you know, we still have a couple of days to make this not be the case, but 14 fights. Excellent. 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 Um, then you have two five round fights, um, which is a little annoying. I mean, only because again, when you have five round fights, they just project just so much better than three round fights in general that it does kind of lead towards more, con you know, more chalky constructions. However, 14 fights is a lot. And as we will as we will get into, the two main events are not exactly, you know, unfadeable. You know, you have and we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it. Um, but you, you'll see that you can build lineups without either of those five round fights and still have a shot. Um, so with 14 fights, you can probably get some unique lineup constructions without having to be too crazy, which is kind of what I like. Um, all right, so let's just get started. As, and I, th I think you'll see when we go through this card, um, there are some key fights. There are some key kind of pivot fights. And there are some, you know, kind of very obvious fades. One thing you'll notice, and just kind of just really just scanning at this board really quickly, is that there's no real huge favorites. You know, the two biggest favorites on the board, one is Yusef Zalal, and he's only three to one. And the other big favorite is Mike Malat, and he is only 0.2, you know, 2.6 to one. So you don't have these big eight to one under uh, favorites dominating the card like you sometimes do. And also, I would say good on uh, DraftKings for not uh, making a ninety four, ninety five, ninety six hundred dollar fighter this week um, because they usually just kind of do anyway, even if the, the fighter's not worth it. But I think that this pricing is it's pretty sharp. You know, I think that this is exactly where most of these fighters should be you know if we factor in their their win odds you know um now again it's more to it than just win odds and i don't think DraftKings is ever going to qualitatively you know price fighters uh, according to their upside you know or or their grappling or anything like that i think they are going to continue to just go with with win odds but i do see very little in terms of you know of a money line issue and that makes it makes it sharp and it makes it a little more challenging. So uh, good on DraftKings for for either doing it on purpose, right, or getting lucky and having it just kind of fall in their laps uh, with the way it worked out this week. Nevertheless, uh, first fight on the card, you have Jamie Lynn Horath at minus 220. And she on uh, it's 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 odd to see, but she is you know, one of the top favorites on the card, three to four third or fourth highest favorite. And even though you do have this kind of bunched salary situation, 8,800 for her, while normally 8,800 for a minus 220 favorite is, is, you know, pretty good. She just lacks the upside uh, needed to, to, to play her in DFS to any real degree. I mean, you have her inside the distance line is plus 350, which is, Really, the the price is really the the inside the distance line you want for someone who's seven seven thousand, like seventy two hundred, or seven thousand. I would say, um, and unless she has an incredible amount of grappling upside, uh, she's just really unplayable. 
I think if anything, Petrovich would be the the playable side in this fight. I mean, she's only um she's only seventy four hundred, and while she doesn't have a lot of a lot of uh, finishing upside. She does have three takedowns in her last fight and two two takedowns in the fight before that. Second one, the one two before, was against Luana Carolina. It was not exactly the easiest to take down. She didn't win that fight, but yet still, um, she does have some wrestling. Jamie Lynn Horth, though, does you know have a size advantage, which makes the the takedown defense uh, makes the takedown route a little bit tricky. So I think overall, I think this is a pretty pretty handy fight to just fade. And I know it's hard to do to just fade the first fight of the night because, you know, if, if the, if somehow Jamie little horse just goes crazy at 8,800 and scores 120, um, you're just going to feel like your whole night's ruined. But I just think that the whole thing is a fade. So if anything, maybe I'll get some Petrovich, but I think that for the most part, this, this fight's just going to be off the board for me. Like Cody Gibson against Chad Ellinger or Ellinger. Um, this is definitely a, a second slash third tier fight. I mean, you have 8,700, 7,500 and, and even with that kind of mid range type pricing, you're going to need some upside here. And Gibson, you take a look at him. You start with the favorite always in these things. Gibson inside the distance is, what is he? Plus 240. Ah, it's just, it's just not great. Okay, at 8,700. It's just really not that great. And unless you can convince me he's got a lot of takedown upside, which he really doesn't, um, uh, he's probably going to be somewhat of a fade. You do have this one fight here against Katona where he got into a war, you know, with 100, he got in a loss, 164 significant strikes. But aside from that one performance, he really doesn't. He's not really conducive to, to high fantasy scores, either for or against. So, uh, unless for some reason Chad has some really, really good takedown upside. I mean, listen, he did have four takedowns against, uh, who's it, Joe Johnson or whatever. Uh, but aside from that, that, that's, again, sort of an outlier performance. Uh, he's getting up there, what, 36, 37 years old. He doesn't have a great inside the distance line as well. We'll take a look at him. I mean, plus 650. So right off the bat, I think you have two fights, which you kind of, you kind of want to fade here. Okay. Uh, third fight going up the board. We have uh, Sidey versus Garrett Armfield. And now we're getting into this range where y- you you might want to pivot to something like this. All right. So you look at the inside the distance line. You see my, well, we'll look at, we'll look at the favorite first. So Sidey inside the distance is plus 285. Ugh. It's just not going to be good enough. I mean, I'm sorry. I would love to to find the, a way to play this fight, but unless again he's got great takedown upside, which it doesn't look like, it's just it just doesn't look so great. Now Garrett Armfield's kind of more of the name. People like playing him. Um, he was in a really sick fight against High Stand. He got a knockdown and a reversal, and then he eventually got subbed. Really, really great fight. Um. And then he had a fight against Katona. Uh, again, just kind of a striking battle. Decision win, 77 points. That's just not good enough. The only time he ever scored was in this in this first round KO, which of course, I mean, you got to get a first round KO, you get a knockdown, you're going to score 120. It's the way it is. Um, it was against kind of a bad, kind of a fraudulent uh, Asian fighter, Kazama. So for some reason, everybody always kind of likes to play him. So I think he's going to end up being sort of a popular underdog. Um, I don't think you need to do it, though. I mean, look, okay, he's plus 112. So maybe there's actually money line value as well at 7,600. And then his inside the distance line is plus 285, which is the same as Sidey. So I think that this is fine. I, I just, I just at the end of the day, think it's going to be as I'll shout out to Magic MMA, he says you say this a lot. Is a he might be like the hipster underdog play of the of the day, um, and I think that he's going to end up being a little over owned as a result. But certainly looks like one of the better underdogs so far. I mean, unless you consider Petrovic 
a good underdog. Um, so yeah, I think Armfield is fine, but I think in, in the GPP world, I think he's going to be somewhat overowned. All right, so Nascimento versus Romanoff. I mean, this is this is a fight which you know, I, everybody kind of wants to play, but is sort of afraid to. So here's the deal. You have both these guys with a very similar inside the distance line. Romanov plus 185, Nascimento plus 185. And it's an 8,300, 7,900 fight. On the metrics alone, this is a fight that you really have to play. Um, in, in addition to that, you know, Romanov specifically has takedown upside, I guess. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um and then you have Nascimento, who's got takedown upside, I guess. Right now, now between these two, I mean, you're you're going to hear this, you know, throughout the course of the week. People really want to believe that Romanov is like this guy, okay? That sl- that just jumped on people, multiple takedowns, pounding them out, subbed them. 100 point upside, 128 point upside or or whatever it is. Um and uh and as such is just like kind of a smash play here. But when you really get into it, you know, all of this stuff was against some pretty poor competition, you know? I mean Chase Sherman and Jared Vendera, those were those were viewed as the two like worst heavyweights in the UFC. Okay. And then they brought him up to fight to Tybora, and everybody played him against Tybora. And in the first round, it looked like it was just going to be one of those days for him. And he in a good way, he got the takedown, he was pounding on him, and then he just just stopped. You know, Tybora fought through it and then just kind of got the best of him. And then in this next fight, people really wanted to believe that he could do it again against Volkov. And, and Volkov's like one of the best there is. And he was only 8,600 and people played him. Like, and so and I was one of them. And he did nothing and got slaughtered. Then they, they dropped him four months later to Ivanov. And they're like, okay, there's no way that he is not going to just go crazy in this fight. And I have to say that while, you know, he won and he did get the two takedowns, this this was not what we signed on for when we all played Romanov. We did not sign on for an 83-point performance. What we signed on for was the idea that if he lost, he would, you know, get nothing. And if he won, he would get these 120s. But here he sort of did what he felt like doing and yet still got nothing. I mean, 83 fantasy points. And then he went out against Almeida and just got taken down and just just obliterated. Okay. So people want to play him. They want to believe that he's that guy. Um, So as a result, I think that even though both these guys have the same inside the distance line, I think that Romanov is going to be just incredibly popular at 7,900. So I think if I had to pick between these two with the same inside the distance line, um, I think I would actually go Nas- the Nascimento side. Okay. Now, again, in GPPs, whatever, I mean, you certainly have to play some of the Romanoff. I mean, with those metrics at this price, that's why he's going to be popular. But I just think that people are just sort of hoping for something from Romanoff that just hasn't existed in a while. Now, you could make excuses. You could say, well, you know, he's fought very, very difficult, difficult fighters. And that is true. You know, and, and who is Nascimento? Is he any good or is he like really bad? Well, I'll tell you this. He was he was right there in it against Derek Lewis. And he did get, you know, pretty handy, kind of easy, but kind of low scoring wins against Dantel Mays, Latifi, Bozer, Badeau. See, here's the thing that bothers me. Like, even in his wins, he doesn't really score that well. Boy, I think at the end of the day, I hate to say this. I think the fight might be a fade. I think everybody's going to be kind of forced to play this. And if you can get away with it somehow, and this is why these, these kind of pivot fights, I, I kind of don't want to dismiss too quickly, you know, like the, 
the Sidey Armfield and the Gibson and Ellinger, whatever, is I do think this fight can bust. You know, without 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 anybody really complaining, you know. So we'll see. All right, moving up, we have Yusuf Salal versus Jack Shore. Um, we're gonna talk about this from a betting b- breakdown. We talk about this tomorrow, but I, I know what I like in here from a betting breakdown, from a betting perspective. You're gonna have to go to Friday to see that. But what you have is kind of like two Yusuf Salals, right? You have the Yusuf Salal before 2024, where he really couldn't do anything. Well, okay, what couldn't he do? He beat Lingo, he beat Griffin, he beat Barrett, Pete Barrett. Then he got lost the decision to Tapuria, um, which obviously, that, <laughs> that's, to say the least, had aged well. Then he lost the decision to, to Singu Siu Choi and to Woodson. Then he had a draw against the Mont Blackshear, which is, wasn't bad, actually. And he did have some control time, which is interesting. And then he came back, and he's just, after two years off or a year and a half off, and I don't know what he did. I mean, he fought in the regional scene, got his act together, but this this performance against Quarantillo is pretty insane, okay? Uh, Quarantillo is known to be a cardio bully, and, and Zalal wanted none of this. You know, he just destroyed him. Um, and then Jamal Aaron's just one round, just takedown sub, end of the day. So uh, we don't know which one of these exist, which one we're getting. It's certainly fine to say that he's like a new guy, and then you have the Jack Shore, on the other hand, who he was 15 and 0, like pretty, pretty recently. Okay. Or 14 and 0? No, 15, he was 15 and 0. Um, 16 and 0. He was 16 and 0. He was beating everybody. Uh, he was getting takedowns all over the place. Four, three, six, two, three. And then he ran into Ricky Simone and got just rolled. All right. Zero takedowns. He got taken down himself and got destroyed. Then against Amir Khani, he, uh, he fought up some adversity, got a takedown, and got a sub uh, as a big favorite. And then he got dusted by uh, by Joe Anderson Brito. Right? So you have Jack Shore, who used to be like everybody's darling, just getting takedowns, winning as the favorite, you know, getting some scores, whatever. And now he's just kind of just known as like whatever against Zalal, who is kind of on the other side, other side of this. Now, if that didn't, wasn't enough of a hint of who I'm going to be betting in the betting streets, well, well, you know, I don't need to tell you. But as far as DFS goes, uh, Zalal at 9,100, the problem here is his inside the distance line. The inside the distance line is probably not even minus 110. We'll take a look. Uh, Not even close, like plus 250. So for him to be a really good play at 9,100, he has got to get like some takedowns. And and I find it hard to believe that he's the one with so much takedown upside in this fight as opposed to Shore based on their on their history. Um, I, I think that Zalal can get takedowns, but I think Shore is just as good on the ground. And I think Zalal's main path to victory is probably going to be keeping it at range and beating him on the feet. So I think from a DFS perspective, I think Zalal is probably not preferred. And I I will say that, I mean, listen, I'm probably going to be betting him in the money, in the money line, but even in DFS, you, you have a guy who's 7,100 that can, can do this as far as takedowns go. You just kind of have to try it, you know, uh, even if he loses, there, there, there are variations where he gets like 40 fantasy points and wins and and, and wins the slate at 7,100. So I, I actually think Jack Shore is 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 a very, very good play here. Um, not to mention the fact that I think Zalal is going to be one of the more popular fighters on the slate. Um, so I think that I think Jack Shore is very reasonable here. All right, moving on. Uh, Charles Jourdain versus Victor Henry. Uh, this this reminds me. Uh, of the of the uh the uh fight between Shara and Petrosian this week. It's a mid-range fight that rated to be a striking battle. And from an ownership perspective, it got completely ignored. And the people who won the the G the main GPP played this fight 
uh, to some degree at least, and and that fight ended up optimal. That's what this fight kind of reminds me of this week because you look at the inside the distance lines on both of these guys, and it does look rather poor. You know, you have Charles Jordan. What is it going to be? Plus three hundred at best. Let's see, plus three eighty five. Victor Henry plus 385, you know, so um, it does on the metrics certainly look like a fade. So if we're just really just talking about like who the best plays are, I think this fight is definitely a fade. But I will say this, that that if you are going to just try to fade this Romanov fight somehow, these mid-range fights, <laughs> just part of me really wants to play this low-owned pivot of either either fighter in this in this fight so um hopefully that you know doesn't confuse you but but that's that's what i feel all right uh moving on we have jasmine jazz davicius versus ariana lipsky she jasmine is one of the you know three most likely winners on the slate she is but yet she's only two to one and at 9k you usually get a little bit better than two to one odds now the thing is though about jazz davicius is that although she doesn't have much of an inside the distance line, as you'll see, she is a uh, fantasy machine. Like when she gets it going, okay, um, you'll you'll see. I mean, you have even against Klein four takedowns, but I'll say this: not a lot of strikes. You know, not a lot of of, of strikes. Only forty strikes in that nine minutes of control time. Cachuera. Now this was this was a. <laughs> I was at this one in Toronto. This this is fantasy. This is like a gold mine. You got a knockdown, two takedowns, eleven minutes of control time, and all of these pitter patter strikes. Yikes! Um, you have this one, which is not bad. Uh, four takedowns and all this control time. So, here's the deal. I mean, she can do it, and she can get there, but can she get there? Enough for 9,100. Obviously, 169 doesn't. But this was against the person with the worst takedown defense in the United States. Okay? In Priscilla Ketchewer. Um, Ariana Lipsky does not have bad takedown defense. At least not anymore. I mean, she's really been working on that, apparently. Um, so... Uh, I think that, <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Do you like anybody this in this in this this card sheets? I, I don't know. I mean, we have to figure this out because Jazz Davis is 9100. I mean, she's going to need a number. And first of all, she doesn't necessarily have to win. She's only a two to one favorite. And even if she wins, even if she gets her takedowns, which she's not guaranteed to do, what does she get? Ninety. I mean, De Silva's. I mean, she's Lipsky. De Silva. She's she's not giving up 120 fantasy points. It's just not happening. Um, I mean, as a matter of fact, I mean, if you tell me that Jazz Davis is going to be the most popular, one of the most popular fighters on the slate, and only a two to one favorite, and I can get De Silva at 7200 in 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 a possible scramble on the ground, get a De Silva. I remember we we cashed on this one. The uh, the silver by sub, that was fun. Maybe we maybe we get one of those. Why not? Uh but this is gonna. You know, I went into this thinking this is gonna be such a straightforward card. This is this is this is a train wreck. All these favorites, I kind of want to fade. This is a little annoying. All right, but we'll 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 find something to play. I guess. Um. All right, I know what we play. We'll get we'll get there in a little bit. Uh, Eamon Zahabi versus Pedro Munoz. All right, this this is this fight is where fantasy points go to die. Um, let's we'll take a look at the inside the distance line here. We have Zahabi inside is plus seven fifty. I don't think I've ever seen a fighter at that price be a plus seven fifty inside the distance. Even Munoz inside the distance plus four fifty. Yeah, this is going to be low owned, but this is this is there's no way I mean I could do this. I mean I'd rather. Play this Jordan fight, the Jordan fight in this one. This is a full fade. Okay, so if I have to play somebody, uh, well, we'll get we'll get to some some other ones later. But if you have to play a favorite, this is the guy I'm going to want to play. Okay, yeah, Mike Malott. Yeah, okay, he lost his last fight, whatever. But he's minus two sixty five. 
He's got an inside a distance line of minus 140, which is light years, right, ahead of everybody else in this range. Uh, and, and, and not to mention, he does have maybe – He's got some takedown. He, he took down Neil Madney four times before he completely gave up. You know, he got he got out cardioed by Neil Madney, who, you know, he drags you into the swamp. I mean, it just happens. So I uh I think this is the best play. I I like this one much more than Zalal. I like this one much more than Jazz Davicious. You know, this is a bigger favorite, or at least at least close to it. It's got a much better inside the distance line plus the takedown upside. I think that this is the way you start your lineups. Um, Trevin Giles, uh, the only thing I would say about that side is that you're going to be up against a low own, uh, very high owned play. I imagine him a lot. So you're going to get a great deal of leverage with someone who wins the fight maybe 25% of the time. But um, inside the distance line is poor. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough. I don't want to say it's gonna be tough for me to get to him, and I'll get to him in the one fifty just again for leverage. But but Mike Malad is definitely the A side. He's def I think he's the best player on this thing. Uh, as far as his raw points and upside and chances of him getting there, etc. All right, this next one could be interesting. So again, we're trying to find stuff to play. Like we don't really want to play Jazz Davicious if we can avoid it. We don't want to play Malad. Uh, what's what's his name? Zalal if we can avoid it. Some of these mid-range plays seem somewhat fishy, but we might have to go back to them eventually. What, what about this one? What, what about Barrio versus Stolzfitz? All right, so first of all, Barrio is minus two, two to one as well, and he's 8,900, so we have the same relative price situation. And Barrio, he does not really have the inside the distance line to support this, but it's not terrible at plus Wayne and E5, Right. Like some of these others at eighty nine hundred, we we looked at, and he was better. Than, wasn't he better than these other? Wasn't he better than Cody Gibson, for example? Let's just double check this. Cody Gibson inside was plus two forty, right? Uh, Sidey, it wasn't even close, right? Plus two eighty five. The Romanov fight we talked about. That's obviously you know looks good. The Jordan fight, uh, they're both plus 285, right? Um, so this is this is a good spot. And in addition to that, he also has volume. And so if he maybe he doesn't finish, he could get a big volume-based decision that could score 100 sometimes. So I think Barrio is a very, very good play here relative to everything else we've talked about. I don't think he's going to be that popular either. So I do like that. And yet on the other side, you have this sneaky little inside the distance line of Dustin Stolfitz, which is like anywhere you look between plus 300 and plus 350. And on a card like this, where we've already seen that that inside the distance lines are kind of tough to come by here as far as you know having good metrics, I think Stolzfist is a pretty good underdog here. Um, so I don't know whether this ends up being sneaky, but I think this fight is pretty sneaky. The, the Barrio Stolzfist fight. I think this is going to be one of my core my core plays is to make sure I get get something from this fight. You watch one says Ship It Nation and the other like ownership people put out their stuff, and Barrio it's like thirty five percent owned. And there's just no way. I just I just can't imagine it. They're gonna play. They're gonna play Jasmine because she, you know she puts up points. She's gonna. They're gonna put Zalal up. It's the new Zalal. They'll play him a lot. They'll play the the Malat. They'll play the main events. They'll play the Romanov fight. We'll get to Derek Lewis in a minute, but but I think that the burial one might go underappreciated. So I'll, that's gonna be my main my main source of of leverage. I think right now. All right, Chow Machado or Cal Machado versus Brendan Ribeiro, uh, light heavyweight fight. I imagine the metrics are going to be pretty good here. Let's take a look at the odds. 80, well, the price is 8,500, 7,700. So let's just see if these guys are under two to one to finish. I think they might be. Let's see. Light heavyweights of stuff. Yeah, there you go. So Machado inside plus 145 and Ribeiro inside plus 200. I think these are good. You know, I, I think these are, this is a much, this is a much better fight. 
than any of this stuff down here, you know? Better than the Jamie Lindhorth fight, better than the Gibson fight, better than the Sidey fight. This Romanov fight, again, you're going to have to kind of deal with, you know? Definitely better than the Jordan henry fight. So I think this fight is really, really good. And I think both fighters, relative to their price, are worth playing. Um, you have Machado plus 145 at 8,600. That's really good. Ribeiro at plus 200 at 7,700. That's that's very similar to Romanov, right? Like Romanov, we'll take a look again. Romanov inside was plus 185. And that's not that far off. For Ribeiro, it's plus 200, you know? So I do believe that Ribeiro is going to be much lower owned than Romanov. So I think I think we're getting somewhere here. Um, all right. Uh, now, this next fight is, from the metrics, is going to be even tougher to fade than the Romanov fight. You have uh Jonta Denise versus Derek Lewis minus 160 versus plus 140 on the money line and actually Lewis is a little underpriced as far as DraftKings goes at 7600 relative to his money line but it doesn't really matter as far as the money line goes because you're going to have really really strong inside the distance lines here you're going to have Lewis plus 170 Wow, right? And 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 Denise minus 120. So this this is the the obvious key fight that you're probably going to want to play. Okay? Uh I think even more so than the Romanov fight, I think the Derek Lewis fight, these metrics are just extremely strong. Um is this going to be higher owned than the Romanov fight maybe? Um uh, I'm not sure. Nonetheless, uh, this is again, this is a this is a tough one to fade. But I do think that from a, like an ownership perspective, I think if you key the Lewis fight and the Romanov fight, I think you're getting too chalky. I think you're going to have to pick one of them and fade the other. Um, so I happen to pref- I think I prefer this one because I do see worlds where this Nascimento fight bust. I don't see the world where the Lewis fight bust. Now, now again, like what? Who cares what I see? I mean, we do are supposed to just look at the metrics here, but even the metrics are stronger here. Plus 170, you know, for Lewis inside at a price of 7,600. That's like, oh, that's rough business, you know? So you're going to want to play both sides of that. All right, so now we're at the main events. Uh, you have Aaron Blanchfield versus Rose Namajunas. So you have a five-round fight. So a five-round fight is usually very conducive to DraftKings scoring. The issue here... It might be that Rose and Emma Yunus fights might be where fantasy points go to die. Um, especially the way this fight rates to play out. So you have Erin Blanchfield, who, you know, she was on a roll. She was steamrolling everybody. She was getting submissions over Jessica Andrade, among other fighters. She ran into Manon Fioro, and she could get nothing going with her ground game. Uh, she didn't even try to get takedowns after like three attempts and very frustrating performance from her. Um, and then, so, so for her to win this fight, she's going to need to get this to the ground. She's not going to win a striking battle with Rose Namajunas. And I don't think that Rose Namajunas gives up anything. You know what I mean? Like she, is she going to really give up like, like takedowns? to to uh to Aaron Blanchfield. I mean, she I guess she gave up some to Asparza in this in this snooze fest over here. But I don't know, man. You know, I was I was I remember this fight against Jean Wei Lee. I mean she even got two takedowns of her own. She just got five takedowns against Tracy Cortez. Is, is this is this really going to happen for for Blanchfield? And it's like annoying because uh, you have to you you have to go with the metrics here. You have to say, okay, if in fact Blanchfield wins, how is that going to happen? Because she is a favorite. I I don't see the world where she wins kind of a stand up striking battle. So I guess she has to get some kind of ground game going somehow to win this. It's just so hard to see. 
You know, I mean, we've Rose has been just doing this for so long and she just doesn't give up a lot of fantasy points like this. Um, on the other hand, you have Rose herself who, listen, if she had it her way, she would keep this on the feet. She has far superior striking, far superior take, uh, what you call it, uh, footwork, and just keep this at that range and just piece her up for five rounds. But I've also seen Rose um, get takedowns of her own. I mean, she got five takedowns against Cortez when we were worried about Cortez taking her down. She got takedowns against Zhang Wei Li when she was worried about that. So if, if Rose Namunu, if, if Rose Namunus wants to try, she probably could get Blanchfield to the ground if she wanted to. I don't know if she wants to engage in that type of thing, but so this is my problem. I don't see a world where Blanchfield, you know, wins, except in ways that unfortunately is going to score a lot. Like if she, if I'm wrong and she completely just runs over Rose and, and just takes her down, submits her, 110, 84 DraftKings, I mean, 84 salary, it's over. You know, she wins the slate. But I, the thing with Rose is that Rose, she can win fights that does not score optimal here. So I don't, I don't know what I want to do with this fight. I know I want to do something. I just, I just don't know what. I guess at the end of the day, I'm just supposed to play both fighters um, because I don't think this is going to be as highly owned as some of the other main events that we see. Um, because again, it's kind of tough for these women, <laughs> these women events for people to really get behind them, unless you have that that case from a few weeks ago where you had Valentina Shevchenko where you just knew that she was going to just go for zillions of takedowns. The Blanchfield thing is tricky. I don't know. So I, I'm going to, listen, you have to play some of both because if in fact Blanchfield wins, there are variations where she gets her out of there in, in fine style with a big score. I just, I just think I'm supposed to play more of Rose here. Um, that's just the way I feel. All right. Uh, Moreno versus Albazi. Uh, again, it's it's a it's a five round fight, but it's not your five round fight that's just kind of guaranteed to 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 score well. I mean it it probably will. I mean, remember in these these flyweights, they 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 really put up a lot of volume and they get a lot of stuff going on, but they usually don't finish. And this particular fight doesn't have that much in the form of takedowns. I mean, I guess Albazi. You could say that he's got some takedown upside here. But when's the last time Moreno really gave up so many takedowns? Oh, well, Bazzi have one, one, two. He's not like a pure wrestler here. It feels to me that it's just kind of like Moreno's just going to win. You know what I mean? Like he, he put on a very, very poor performance. And well, people said it was a poor performance because Brandon Roy Val, they ran out of gas, or whatever. But Brandon Roy Val, I mean, he's legit, you know, especially with respect to. It's cardio nowadays and to lose to Pantoja in what ended up being kind of a close decision. Uh, he got three reversals on him. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of inclined to just say Moreno's got, got a lot of pride. And after that performance or whatever, losing that, I think he's going to come out and smoke him. I don't know. That's, that's, that's my analytical take here. So um, I am going to go back and let's, let's take a look at this again. So if you play Moreno and you play Rose, if you want to do that, I don't even think you have to play this event at all. Okay. Then you play someone from this, the Derek Lewis fight and you play him a lot. You avoid say jazz, the vicious, you avoid Zalal. And then you, Oh, you got to do this. Right. And then you play maybe burial. This is, this is sort of chalky, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's pretty chalky. But at least you fade Zalal and Jazz Davicious, and you fade the, and then if you do this, you would have to fade the Romanov fight, you know, because then otherwise it gets too chalky. Then you do something kind of kind of kooky, like you play. Oh, you know what you do here? I, I can't give you the full lineup, but you play like Ribeiro and leave like three hundred on the table, something like that. This, this that would be an example of like a lineup that like maybe isn't unique, but maybe is only duped like 12, 13 times or something like that. It fades some of the biggest favorites. It fades one of the key fights. So that's something you could do as far as, you know, how to analyze a card like this. And again, I don't know what, what this, this, that, that women's fight's going to end up doing. I might end up just fading that whole thing. You know, if you want, like instead of that, then, then go ahead then go play Romanov. 
whatever. Okay. And this way you fade that whole second five round fight, which is probably gonna get some ownership because it's five rounds. But uh yeah. All right. So uh stay tuned. So tomorrow we're gonna do a betting breakdown. Uh where we're somewhat contrarian. And when I do that, you're gonna probably hear me talking about all the things I said today and why you shouldn't apply them to betting. Uh, any in any case, we're gonna do a lineup construction video maybe later tomorrow or first thing Saturday morning. And uh, that will do it. Good luck, everybody.